Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday, July the 28th, I think it is, 2021, and welcome to tonight's Wednesday midweek Bible study here at Paragraphs Missionary Baptist Church. On behalf of Pastor Smizer, we want to welcome you who have tuned in to be with us by way of the internet and those who are with us here in the sanctuary. We hope, pray, and trust that something is said or done to help you along the way this Christian journey. Tonight our lesson will be uh, the last lesson in our unit on faith and salvation. We've been talking for several weeks from the book of Romans, defending faith and salvation. We want to give you a solid foundation for your faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. We want to welcome uh, Reverend Williams with us to open up with a word of prayer. Uh, go ahead, Reverend Williams. Thank you, Reverend Dow. Mm -hmm. My brothers and sisters, let us bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to see this day that we may thank you for your wonderful goodness to us. Yeah. We bow before you, Heavenly Father, knowing that you are God and there is none other that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and you have sacrificed yourself that we may be saved, and that you are the Holy Spirit that guides us. We come this evening, Heavenly Father, to learn more of your word, that we may share with others, and that we may put it into practice in our lives. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the men and women that have stand up for the word of God, that have not let anyone to distort it or to make them be persuaded unto something else. And we know, Heavenly Father, we're supposed to put our faith completely in you. There is no God but you. Yeah. And we pray to you in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Williams, for that opening prayer. As we look at our lesson tonight, we want to try to remember our focus. Stay focused on what we're trying to do. Paul is making his comparison between grace and law. The law of Moses. Remember the first disciples or the first people that heard the gospel message were the Jews, the children of Israel, the, the children of Moses. They always depended on Moses to be their leader, guide, and lawgiver. They went to him for every problem that they had. I want us to start out by looking at chapter uh, 1, verse 17 in John. I want you to turn to John 1 and 17 to open our defense of Paul's ministry in the book of Romans. John 1, 17. I want you to understand how God never does anything by her happenstance. He's not a, what's the word, haphazard kind of a God. He's an on-time God, as we say. But his time is his time. It's not our time. We've got to remember that. Look at verse 17 in John chapter 1. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Keith, what do you think? I'm, I'm so, it's, it's so emphatic what John is saying here. I know John is not necessarily the part of our subject, but as Paul compares law with grace, we've got to see where both of them came from. The law came from Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. What do you think about that, Keith? Well, I think that some people don't understand that when Moses went up on the mountain, he went up to receive the law from God. So therefore it was bound, it was strong, it was authentic, and there wasn't anything else that could stand in front of it. But yet as time went on, others tried to put traditions ahead of the law, you know, ahead of the commandments, and that would not stand. So John here is letting them know that Christ is the answer to the law, yes. that he's the one that we should rely upon and benefit from and be thankful for. Amen. Amen. Thank yes. you so much for that, Keith. That's so true. Brothers and sisters, if you are working for your salvation, 
Our prayer is that you learn the difference between works and grace. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the difference, we hope, pray, and trust that one of, one of us has something to say to help you to stop trying to work for your salvation and just work because you are saved. That's kind of the phrasing that we use. Don't work to be saved. Work because you are saved. And that's part of what Paul is trying to get the new Christians to learn. Turn from Moses. And it made the Jews so mad. Every time Paul would try to defend Christ and tell them that Christ was Messiah, they would get mad and try to persecute him as they did the church in the early uh, years of the church. It was always a conflict between law or Moses and Jesus Christ and grace. That's what we want you to see tonight. Chapter 10 is part of uh, the dialogue that many ministers use for uh, revivals. Many of us go to chapter 10 to begin our revivals. Our heart and prayer is for Israel that they might be saved. We've got to remember that. That's chapter 10, I think, verse 1 it is. Remember, Israel is to be saved, not rich or famous or popular. That, that, that wasn't the concern. They were to be served, saved. Paul's desire was to save his people. They could not be saved by the law of Moses because they had to keep it perfectly. Keith, they could not keep it perfect. No, neither could we. <laughs> no man can, no woman can. If, if that were possible, we'd be boasting about how we were like, just like the publican who went up to pray and the Pharisee who went up to pray. We'd be boasting about how great we were and what all we had done. And we have nothing to boast about. Mm. Uh, if you go to the first verse of that chapter, it has something really insightful to see and to hear what Paul says here about his feelings for Israel. He wants Israel to be saved. Yeah. And he doesn't want Israel to try to look upon the law for their salvation. Yeah. But for Jesus Christ is their salvation. That's true. And that's wonderful to know. That we have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit that are all working on our behalf. Not working against us, but working on behalf. And so therefore we should rely upon what Christ has said rather than what men say. Come down. And remember, uh, thanks Keith, it's not so easy to abandon what you were taught all your life. Mm -hmm. The Jews were taught to depend on Moses, to obey Moses. And it's okay to, to obey Moses. I'm not saying don't obey Moses. I'm saying Christ is superior mm -hmm. to Moses. That's, That's right. the whole point. That's right. You must remember to get focus, get the uh, focus right, get the priority right. If you're going to do the work, do the work, but do the work for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. We've got to remember that. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 1 through 4. If you got your Bibles, turn to chapter 10 in Romans, because we're going to try to defend our position for tonight. We don't want you to believe and just believe. Oh, I just believe. No, we want to give you a reason to believe. God gives us a reason. He says, I think it's in Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together. Yeah. Let's talk about it. He always is willing to listen to you talk. Uh, again, we have said... It's one thing to question God. It's another thing to ask God questions. God is not afraid of our questions. Yeah. But what we do, we want to question God because he doesn't answer when we want him to answer. We abandon the position and then talk about, well, God doesn't answer my prayer. Yes, he does. He doesn't. You just don't like the answer. That's what it is. So, so listen to Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul is saying, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Notice what Paul is saying. They have a zeal. It's okay to have zeal. 
You've got to have zeal in the right way. Well, it's one thing to just believe. A whole bunch of people believe. They've got a zeal for their God, whatever their God is. They go out there and try to defend their God. They try to get converts to their side if that's what they like. But Paul is saying, not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, it's proper for God, if that's what he wants to do, if he wants to change the dispensation from law to grace, he's got a right to do that, especially since Christ has died. God has moved the dispensation from law to grace. Uh, verse 3 again, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, as Keith has already said, you could not keep the law. You try to establish your own law. You, you can't satisfy God by trying to keep your own law. You can do the best you can, and still it's going to come up short. Uh, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end. Christ is the end. Once Christ has come and finished his ministry, he said it is finished. The whole work of salvation was finished right there. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And to whom? Not just to the Jews. To everyone that believes. Anybody. He's opened the door. He's opened the gate to everybody. Not just the Jews. We have, we have taught in the past to the Jew first. But also to the Greek. It's not that he exempts. The, well, Greeks being Gentiles, of course, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. God's plan is on schedule. He offered salvation to the Jews. The Jews rejected it. And then Paul said, well, from henceforth, I go to the Gentiles. I'm tired, I'm tired of trying to minister to you all. So I'm going to turn to someone who will receive the gospel. Keith, you got any points on that? You have really uh, the nail with the hammer twice. <laughs> when you said righteousness and when you said the law, you did yeah. it twice. And the thing about it is that when we look at this, Paul is talking once again to some people that he hadn't seen. Right. But he wanted the best for them and he wanted them to know mm -hmm. that there are gonna people who are gonna come try to confuse them and try to make mix something else up in their belief in Jesus Christ. And they shouldn't worry about those things. Because as we know, that once we get down to verse 9, he says, look, it's just as simple if you will listen. And he says, two things you have to do. You have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart yeah. that God raised him from the dead, then you, you, you shall be saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, just that, it's just that simple. But like I said last week, we make it complicated. And then he goes on to give an example on verse 13. He says, call upon it. See what he'll do for you. Mm -hmm. And when I call upon him, I see what he does. How he makes things that were wrong, right. How he gets me out of predicaments and problems, which he has control of. How he loves us so. When he doesn't have, he doesn't need us. Right. But still he loves us, that we may know who he is. And if you would, look at verse number 16, that same chapter. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? And we all know that Isaiah chapter 53 is speaking of Jesus and the people that is unbelief and how Jesus has suffered for us. But yet there are still some that will not believe except Jesus Christ. We miss our opportunity by rejecting him. And we don't want anything to cause us to, to miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Christ is the answer. And then going back to that verse number nine, uh, some people were saying, as Gnostics is what they call them, that to be saved you had to have Jesus, but you also had to have these additional things. And Paul was confirming what Jesus had said already, no, you don't need any additional things. Only thing you need to do is to believe and confess with your mouth. Believe and confess with your mouth, and it's done. And that's wonderful to know. That that's all we stand in need of. Excellent, excellent points, mm -hmm. Reverend William. 
again, Paul's argument is the superiority of Christ to the law. If we can get you to understand that much, I think we've done a good deed for the day. I want us to look back at verses 5 and 6 and 7 to see how Paul presents an argument, a question period, that has already been answered. Look at verse uh, 5, 6, and 7. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law. If you're going to try to keep the law, Paul tells you that Moses has already described what the righteousness of the law is. And he's going to tell you how it is again. He says, the man that doeth those things shall live by them. You have to live by every word of the law if you're going to try to keep the law. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible for us to do The Jews couldn't do it. That's why they were rejected. They got to depending on all of their traditions and what the fathers did and what the elders did. God got sick and tired of it. And he provided his own sacrifice and said, I'm going to do this one more time. And that's going to be the end of all the law. The Jews trying their best to keep it. The man that's going to do the law must live by every word of God. Look at verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Who's going to go up and bring Christ down? Nobody. It's already been done. There's no need to try to reinvent the wheel, as they say, as they used to say. It's already been done. Who's going to do that for us? You can't, you can't go into heaven and bring Christ. If you can do that, good for you. I don't know anyone else who can do that. But to me, you cannot go into heaven and bring Christ back down when he's already been here and paid the price for our sins. Or who shall descend into the deep? Who shall go beyond the waters? Who shall go into the deep? into the pit. Who shall go down anywhere and find Christ and bring him up from the grave? Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. Who's going to do that? Can you do that? I can't do that. It's already been done. Christ has died and God is satisfied. We have to remember the whole key is to satisfy God, to appease God. Christ is the propitiation for our sins and God is not angry anymore. That's what we need to understand. Keith, I think I make that point pretty well. Very well, very well. <laughs> Let us take our Bibles and go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number five. Moses is speaking of the future. What's going to happen in the future? All right. Verse number 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses number 15. And the Lord thy God shall raise unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, Mm -hmm. like unto me, unto him will you shall hearken. Then if you go down to verse number 18 of that same chapter, he says this, I will raise up a prophet from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. Moses is talking about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that he would speak what God had told him to speak, which he did. He told us that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's wonderful to know. And that we're to follow and trust in God, trust in Christ, and knowing that this, that righteousness, we're not seeking righteousness. Righteousness is seeking us if we look for him, if we listen for him, if we behave, if we put our trust in him. He is seeking us. Now, one other place I would like for us to look at on this, and it's also in Deuteronomy, where he speaks of Moses. Well, and uh, I, I say, I, once again, I do not apologize for using Scripture because Scripture is what we stand on. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 2. Deuteronomy 
Moses is giving his last instructions to the Israelites before he dies, and he wants them to stay strong in this. Verse number 21, I meant to say. Chapter 32, verse number 21. God is speaking here. And they have moved me to jealousy that they, sorry, and they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their own vanities. He's trying to steer them away well. from the idols that are being worshipped in other countries. In fact, that's one of the reasons he put them out of Egypt. And so he could get from all those idol worshippers. So he could prepare them for the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. And we should know that this preparation did not take 10 years, 15 years. It took hundreds of years. But it still came. And that we're to wait upon and seek the Lord because he still come. He came. Now one more scripture. Go to Isaiah. We spoke to Isaiah a little bit earlier. Reverend Dowd did. To go to Isaiah chapter 65 and see what verse 1 and 2 is. You know, uh, when a little kid down the block got a new toy and we didn't get one, sometimes we became envious of that toy. But it was just nothing but a toy. It was something that would be played with for a while and then disregarded and cast aside. But the Word of God is something you do not cast aside. And Moses, I'm sorry, Isaiah here is talking about the people of Israel. Well, let me just read the verses. I'm sorry to them that ask not for me. I'm found to them that sought me not. I said, Behold me. Behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Jealousy will cause you to want to be friends with people, but that's because you want something that they have. All right. But what Moses is saying here was that in the coming future, there are going to be some other people that are going to call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. And they weren't chosen, but yet they still believed in Christ. And that's what Paul is getting to here in Romans chapter 10. They were not chosen, but they were still believers in Christ. And going on to where Reverend Dow is going to soon is the fact that how could these people in Rome know about Jesus Christ and salvation? They had to have a preacher. They had to have someone to bring that word to them, either by letter or by voice or by some other means. Someone that would honestly tell them about the coming of Jesus Christ. So as we go on in our lesson in verse number 14 of chapter 10, we can see how God was working through Paul, through the other disciples. He was working to prepare them that they may tell people the good news that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Rip them down. You're right, Keith. And this is one of the main things that we, when we have revival, we try to invite those who are not saved, mm -hmm. especially. We do want all of the saints to come to our revivals, but we especially want those who are unsaved, not to pick at them, not to show them up, not to put them on front street, but to tell them about how the salvation that is available to all, it's mm -hmm. available to everyone. Those who are saved don't need to be saved a second time. That's not in scripture. Mm -hmm. You're saved, you need to be edified. But those who are unsaved really need Christ more than they need anything else. Look at, as Keith had just said, we're going to go to these last few verses and we'll probably finish it up. Look at verses 13, 14, and 15. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the essence of the gospel. Mm -hmm. For whosoever will call. Will you call? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Our problem is we get too hinky and, and uppity. We don't even want to call. We mm -hmm. want God to come to us. We don't want to go to God. But his hand is always outstretched to us. If we will but take his hand. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him of whom they, uh, they have not believed? I can't call on someone I don't even believe. I don't know that they even exist. 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not even heard? Paul's argument is straightforward. He makes no bones about it. He lays it out rationally. How are you going to call on someone you don't believe? How are you going to even believe in someone you've never even heard? I'm not. If I do not know you, why should I believe in you? Even a, 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 a well-known personality in our in our lands today. If I don't know them, I'm not only going to half believe. I might believe what they say, but I'm not going to believe in them until I have heard them for myself. And uh, and how shall they hear without a preacher? This is the essence of what we when we used to have revivals. The preacher preached the gospel. The preacher preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Everyone in the building is to know that. That's the reason we had a whole bunch of people to come and hear what the minister has and not how to get a million dollars and all these inspirational messages, but rather you need to be saved. And look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? If you're going to try to preach somewhere and you haven't even been sent, God hasn't even called you to preach. You ain't got no business trying to do something that even the sons of Sceva got beat up for doing. You shouldn't be trying to do that. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Back in those days, the men, well, essentially the men, walked everywhere uh, and their shoes got dusty and their feet got dirty. And in that sense, when the preacher finally came and they preached the words, their feet were seen as beautiful because regardless of all the dirt on their feet, they had beautiful feet. They were bringing a true message. Mm -hmm. It was the message that they were more interested mm -hmm. in. And the, and the correct preacher, when he was correctly preaching the gospel, brought the beautiful message. Even though he had dirty feet, his message may have been beautiful. You got any more points on that? Uh, pretty much, we, I think we've covered the lesson pretty much. Except for knowing this, that as I said previously, Christ is seeking us. And he's doing wonderful things so that we will seek him. So that we will come together as what? Sons of God. That we may be obedient to him and put our trust in him that not just for us, not just for us as Bagrass Baptist Church, not just for us as members of the congregation of other churches, not just for us that are maybe in a huge nationally known church or someone that's doing wonderful things in missionary work, but for us as the giving thanks to Jesus Christ for our salvation and going in and doing what he did. All right. That he went out to the people. You very seldom do you see Jesus in the temple. Just once in a while. More than likely you see him out in the streets. Touching people, More praying for people. And as Centurion says, Master, you don't even have to come to my house. Just speak the word. That's true. And my servant will be healed. And we see that he does that in our lives. He just, just, just go on our knees and ask him for salvation. And it's there for us. And once we have it, we want to hold on to it tight. And we want to do nothing to make us have fear or disappoint our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit. So that's what we are planning tonight to talk about and have talked about. That salvation is available yeah. to everyone. It's available to everyone. It, it, you know, there are certain things that are not available to me. Some things that I may want, but they're not what I need. But salvation is something that I must hunger and pursue after because it's available to me and I want to have it. So, unless Reverend Dow has anything else you'd like to add at the end? No, I guess we'll close our lesson with this. Remember, as Keith has well said, salvation is available to all. The much often quoted John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, mm -hmm. not just Jews, mm -hmm. whosoever, we mm -hmm. must 
put words in their proper perspective. Mm -hmm. We have memorized that verse, we have recited that verse over and over, but do we really understand that verse? God loves you. Mm -hmm. He loves you so much that he gave his, the only son he had himself that whosoever will believe on his son will have eternal life. Who else is offering you eternal life? No Answer can. that question, Father. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can offer, all men can offer you riches, palaces, airplanes. You may get a jet. Maybe you fly around the world in a jet. That's good for you. Bravo, all of that. But you can't get eternal life anywhere but from God. God is the only one can give eternal life. And even in that, he only gives it to those who believe in his son. The gift that his son gave when he hung, bled, and died on Calvary's cross, he was paying the price for sin for you and for me. John 3.16 is a much beloved verse. We should hold on to that with all that we have. So... Salvation is available to you if you have never accepted Christ. Always. And I encourage you tonight, and Keith encourages you tonight, come to Christ as soon as you can, like yesterday. Come to Christ now mm -hmm. in the midst of all the trials and tribulations that are going on in our world. Men don't know what to do. They don't know what they are doing. We think we're doing good. We're not even trying to get to Christ. We're trying to tell Christians they got to do this. They got to do that. They got. We, you don't have to do anything but come to Christ. If you can trust Him with the remainder of your life and live and work for Him, you will be saved. That's what He said. Just come to Him. Give your life to him, work for him, work with him and other Christians, you will be saved. There's no doubt about it. Put your trust there. Our whole uh, unit has been about faith and salvation. You've got to remember salvation is only offered to those who believe. If you do not believe, you need to begin to believe. We're going to close out with a word of prayer. I'm going to... Say it again. Yeah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray this evening at the close of our study for tonight. John 3.16 tells us that you love us in spite of us. You knew what we needed. We brag and we give other reasons and we latch on to other things. But God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him won't perish. We can't perish. Once we have come to Christ, perishing is out of the picture. We thank you so much for loving us so much as to save us and give us salvation. Thank you for your servant Paul, O oh God, who has laid it out so clearly for us to understand. If we would just do as he said, we can't go into heaven and bring Christ down. We can't descend into the deep and bring Christ up. What we can do is believe in the word that has already been given and keep us forever in your care, we pray, as we close out tonight's study. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Amen. Thank you all for being with us, Keith. Thank you for joining us this evening. And please keep... Romans chapter 10, verse 9, in heart and mind for those that have not been saved, those not be called. If you would just do that, make confession to him, he will save you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Hope to see you Sunday morning in service.